From the Toronto Star, I'm Rudgeon Midler, and this matters. The thing about transit planning in this city and province is that it's always changing. And of course, there's always a domino effect. To that end, our original plan was to have the star's ace transportation reporter, Ben Spur, join us today to talk about the transit projects in this city and some of the new and controversial powers that the province and its agency, Metrolinx, have to build transit in this city. In that conversation, at one point, Ben says this. I think what's really interesting to note too is that historically projects in the Toronto region don't get built as planned. Routes change, projects get canceled. Well, as we'd like to say in this business, the news never stops. And this morning, Robert Benzie, our Queen's Park Bureau Chief, broke the news that the province would like to add a major new transit hub on one of the routes that Ben talked to us about last week. So before we get to Ben, we are now joined by Robert Benzie to talk about what is being touted as a new Union Station to the east. Our first guest today is Robert Benzie. Rob, great scoop today. Thank you so much for making the time to join us. My pleasure, Raji. How are you? I'm doing good. So I'm very, very curious about this news because honestly, it's not that far from where I live. So let's talk about the news today. Where exactly is this transit hub going and what do we know about it now? Well, it's being billed as a union station to the east and it's on what is currently the Unilever lands that are owned by the city. It's a 38 acre site near the Don Valley Parkway, close to the waterfront. It's been you know, ripe for development for a very long time. And what the provincial government would like to do is sort of piggyback on the smart track hub that is already planned for that area so that it, you would have the Ontario line, which is the new subway line that goes from Ontario Place all the way up 16 kilometers through the city to the, the Ontario Science Centre in Don Mills. And that's the signature plan of the provincial government's transit expansion. And if you make this East Harbor hub, you know, with go trains, streetcars, the Ontario line and smart track, it really does take a lot of the heat off of Union Station, which is, a, you know, three or four kilometers to the west. It's an exciting sounding proposal, but you and I have been around this racket a long time. Transit, you know, everyone talks about, oh, we're going to have a monorail or something. <laughs> Shelbyville is getting a monorail. But uh, Toronto's going to get a second Union Station. It's always, the proof will be in the pudding, right? Oh, this is exactly right. Like I said, we had an episode today that's planned that this is sort of wreaks some havoc with. But Rob, here's the question. Why does the province think this is necessary? And then, you know, there's this hope to also build some transit-oriented communities around there. So how is that supposed to all work? Well, as part of the Ontario line, the government introduced legislation last year to fast track these so-called transit oriented communities. And these are communities where instead of just a subway station being a box unto itself, it has apartments and condos adjacent to it, community centers, parkland. They really want to get people out of their cars. Uh, I mean, I mean, it, it, a lot of people in Toronto don't have cars. They want even more people living in Toronto who don't need a car, who can ride their bikes, who can take transit, who can walk. And I think this is part of what they're doing is they're figuring we're going to be digging these massive holes. We're going to have huge construction. Let's just monetize it and make for a better community rather than just having a a little stump of a subway station, have buildings on top of it. And frankly, improve the quality of life, they hope, of residents of some neighborhoods that are already aren't adequately served with transit and don't have the amenities, the community centers, the libraries and all that sort of stuff that perhaps they could use. But the big point is also taking a little bit of pressure off Union Station. Yes, totally. I mean, Union Station is already the busiest transit hub in the country. The construction there has been going on since forever. I mean, it's a, I think it goes back to David Miller being the mayor. So we've had like three mayors and three premiers since that construction started, Kathleen Wynne, Dalton McGinty, and Doug Ford, and it's still happening. So these kinds of things are, are frustrating, and Torontonians are frustrated with the pace of transit expansion. Yes, we have the Eglinton Crosstown happening right now, but that's supposed to open next year. I'll be surprised if it does open on time just because of all the delays that they've had, some of which are related to COVID, some of which are related to other things. What are the challenges we know already about this? I know a lot of people in this area are already not too happy with the Ontario line route, and I think some of them may feel like this is another surprise rabbit out of the hat. That And you know what, Arjun, that's exactly a problem. I mean, this 16-kilometer route snakes through some of the most densely populated parts of the city already, and everybody wants transit. Everyone wants a subway near them. 
They just don't want to live through the construction of said subway near them. And that's one of the reasons that we've seen on, on Eglinton right now. There's a lot of nimbyism there from some neighborhoods because they've had to endure this construction for so many years. And I think this is going to even be a bigger challenge, the Ontario line, because of the, the nature of where it's going to go. But these transit-oriented communities that they're talking about are not necessarily in a place that's already densely populated. Like the Unilever, there's no one living really around there. Also, the government is kind of cognizant, I think, of how they screwed up the Dominion Foundry situation. And that's where they're going to build three condo towers, one of which for affordable housing. It's not very far on Eastern Avenue. It's not very far from where this is. But they went ahead and proceeded without the city. And then there's lawsuits and court actions and so on. It's been messy. They don't want that same kind of mess. So the city is going to be consulted every step of the way. And actually, there has to be buy-in from the city. Super interesting news. I'd be very curious if there's going to be a new East Union station not too far from me. I really, really want to thank you for your time. And it's a perfect setup for our next conversation with Mr. Ben Spur. Thank you for your time today, sir. Bye-bye. That was Robert Benzi, the Star's Queen's Park Bureau Chief. Next, we have Ben Spur, the Star's transportation reporter. The reason we wanted to talk to him is the many stories he's written about the transit projects that are changing people's lives and may start affecting even more people. He recently wrote about how if you live in one of the city's transit corridors, you may need to get a permit to build a deck or pool on your property. We talked to Ben before this morning's announcement, but really, with this new hub, Metrolink's powers could affect even more people. So it's even more relevant with this news. Ben, it's a pleasure to see you and have you on This Matters once again. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So Ben, there's a ton of stuff happening with transit in the city. I believe there are what four sort of major transit projects that are in certain stages of being built right now. Can you just bring us up on speed on sort of where things are at with all of them? Yeah, there are four main projects that the province is pursuing. Uh, you may recall that back in 2019, the province somewhat controversially took over the construction of new subway lines in the city from the TTC. And it's building four projects, the Scarborough subway extension, the Ontario line, the Eglinton West LRT, and the Yun North subway extension. And so all those projects are basically still sort of in early stages of procurement, they call it, basically finding people to, to build these things and putting out contracts for the design and construction construction work. And so they're basically in still in early stages with construction on some of them early works on the Scarborough subway extension and the Eglinton West LRT is supposed to start as soon as this year. Construction for all of them would presumably finish around the end of this decade. I think there's, you know, there's lots of issues within them. There's some, some NIMBY stuff. People are upset about where some things are going to go. I want to get into that, but what exactly is the Building Transit Faster Act? So this is legislation that the province passed last year, and it's supposed to do exactly what it says in the title. It's supposed to help the province build these four transit projects faster. There's been a lot of concern, of course, about the pace of new projects in Toronto and the surrounding area being built. There's lots of delays. We're way behind in building a network that meets the needs of the region. And so the province, the Ontario PC government, introduces legislation to, they say, speed things up. So it does a bunch of different things but it basically gives the province and its transit agency, Metrolinx, uh, some expanded powers to advance the construction of transit projects. Basically sort of streamlines the expropriation process if the transit agency needs to take private land to build these projects, they can do it a bit more quickly. It gives Metrolink some authority to do things like get onto land that's near the transit route to remove things like hedges and fences and things like that. And they, they can actually do that without the consent of the landowner. If they can't reach consent, they try to reach an agreement. But if they can't, Metrolink can just go on. Similarly, with the expropriation process, if your land was being expropriated before, you had the right to go and hold the what was called a hearing of necessity you go plead your case and say, this uh, expropriation isn't necessary. Uh, this legislation removed that for transit projects, land that's being expropriated near transit projects. So just things like that, that the government said used to, to hold up these big transit projects. It's designed to sort of remove some of those obstacles. Now, one of the reasons that I really wanted you to have on is because of one of the most recent stories that you wrote, which I honestly found a little bit outrageous. <laughs> this is about the changes to what they call transit corridor lands. And basically now, if you live within 30 meters of one of these planned projects, what happens now? 
So if you live on or within 30 meters of land that's been designated a transit corridor, basically any construction job on your property needs to get a permit from the transit agency. That's everything from putting a deck in your backyard, putting in a pool, putting an addition on your home it would all require not only a permit from the city, which you would normally need, but also a permit from Metrolinx. And this applies to private homeowners as well as big condo developers who might be building something near the line. And so Metrolinx and, and the, the provincial government say that this just uh, ensures that transit projects won't be slowed down by some construction near the line. They also argue that this helps homeowners, right? That if you're building something on property that a year or two years from now is going to be knocked down to build a, a new subway, you don't want to do that. You want to ha- kind of have everything coordinated. But it is another layer of kind of red tape being introduced by uh, a conservative government that says that they've had to cut down on red tape. And it's just kind of a, I thought it was a really interesting thing that this idea that the transit agency would need to okay you build in a back deck. Oh, I think so. I think this is nuts. I think it's another layer. Absolutely. It's another layer of bureaucracy. But I mean, you know, also let's be real, like, but I really want to put a pool beside where I know a train's going to be going by every day. <laughs> Anyways, my question, this is, okay, this is new. Where is this at right now? So basically the legislation that enabled this designation of transit corridor lands and, and this whole regime has already passed. But what's going on now is that it took some time to finalize the roots of these four transit projects just probably within the next week or two. Metrolinx is going to start sending out letters to affected property owners and it's going to affect thousands of people on just the two projects that are closest to construction start, the Scarborough Subway Extension and the Edmonton West LRT, there are about 2,400 properties that are going to be receiving these letters. And the biggest project of the package, the Ontario line, people have not been notified there yet. So there's going to be thousands of of people across the GTA that are going to be getting these notices. I think what's really interesting to note too, is that historically projects in the Toronto region don't get built as planned. Routes change, projects get cancelled. We've seen the Hamilton LRT recently get cancelled. The Relief Line subway got cancelled and replaced with another project. So I think it's really interesting to see how this unfolds over time because you could easily envisage someone you know, being denied a permit to build something along a supposed route of a transit project only for that transit project to have the route changed for the project to be cancelled. And then years down the line, you know, someone's missed out on constructing a development building a pool or whatever else. And you know, what's the compensation for someone who's missed out on that opportunity? You already mentioned that basically Metrolinx can already just decide to go on your property and even if you don't want them and remove a fence. Do we know if there's any sort of appeals process to this? The whole process for this is spelled out in the legislation and Metrolinx would say that it's in their interest and, and they're committed to sorting out agreements with people they don't want to be going on without people's consent. But if agreement can't be reached, then all Metrolinx is required to do is to give 30 days notice and then they're allowed to go on the land. We'll be right back. So beyond this new permitting system, let's talk a little bit about expropriations. You've already done some great stories about people getting displaced. Let's talk about a story about the renter. Basically, that's one person's place. And then I would like to talk about real estate and Metrolix offering $1 for a garage in what I've been told is a white hot real estate market. So you've written both these things in the last couple of months. What exactly is going on with this? Yeah, the first story you mentioned is a renter, a man named Scott Whiteman. He's he's 56 years old. He lives in a plaza that's going to be knocked down to build the Scarborough subway extension. I think it's fair to say he's, he's a pretty vulnerable person. He lives on disability support. He doesn't have a lot of income. He says he was very lucky to find his apartment, which he pays only $480 for the room that he has above the strip mall. And so now that uh, he's going to lose his apartment as a result of Metrolinx's construction activity. And what's interesting, I think, why I wanted to write about that was that there's a legal system that is set up to compensate people who do lose their homes, but it only really deals with financial compensation. I'm told that by experts that system works pretty well, but for people like Scott, he told me repeatedly, he doesn't need money. He needs a home that he can afford to pay rent in. And so finding a place for $480 a month in Toronto is, is really difficult. So he's worried that 
he could get a package, a settlement from Metrolinx, but he needs to find a landlord who's going to rent to him. He needs to find a, a home that he can afford long term whenever that package from Metrolinx runs out. So I think it just speaks to, I don't think necessarily his case is, is typical. I don't know how many people are in his position, but I think it just speaks to the fact that there are these, while expropriations are compensated financially, there are these intangible, less quantifiable impacts that I think are worth paying attention to as Metrolinx embarks on this massive transit expansion program across the region. And what about the gentleman with the garage? So yeah, this is a, another interesting case. Again, not sure that it's typical. I think that most appropriations don't end up in a big court fight like this. But basically, there's a man named Noel Francis Chantium who owns a garage in King City, just a, a little bit north of Toronto. And his land's going to be expropriated for an expansion of a Go Transit project. And so Metrolinx valued his land at $2.1 million, but they've offered him only $1. And that does sound pretty nuts for sure. But what Metrolinx says is that that basically the land has been contaminated, that it, this garage that's been operating there for many years. So while the land itself is worth more than $2 million, it will cost more than that to clean it up. And so therefore, they've only offered this guy $1 for his land. So it's going to be a messy dispute. It's worth pointing out, Metrolinx doesn't have final say. They don't say, here's $1 and you take it or leave it. They will go through the expropriation process and, and there's a legal regime to get him market compensation for that. But his lawyer has argued to me that Metrolinx has a duty to present a good faith offer and $1 for a land is not good faith. Interestingly enough, and I don't know how much you want to put this in the podcast, but Metrolinx initially would not tell me much about this case. They said it's before the courts and use that kind of excuse that officials often use when they don't want to talk about a potentially messy legal issue. But after our story ran and got a lot of traction, the CBC followed it up and Metrolinx gave them a bit more information about this case. They said that this owner, they alleged, you know, had not been a good environmental steward of the land, to say the least, had, had violated some rules, had been contaminated the soil there. And so they said that the land is not worth as much as he hopes it does now. And it's his fault, they claim. It's a messy dispute that's going to last, I think, take a while to untangle but certainly a strange one. Sounds like the best deal in real estate in the GTI I've heard in a long time. <laughs> now, you know, one of the things you mentioned is, is that the, through the expropriation process, there are supposed to be laws that protect these people and their homes and their properties. Are you seeing that happen or are we too early in the process right now? I think we are pretty early in the process in terms of these four transit projects that Metrolinx is pursuing. They've had other transit projects that they've built in the past. I spoke with experts with lawyers who have worked on cases involving Metrolinx and they told me, that Metrolinx is, is pretty responsible in these cases, that there is a, a good legal system in place to ensure people's compensation and that Metrolinx is responsible and acts well. But I think it is just worth, you know, that Metrolinx is going to embark, as I say, on this massive expansion of transit projects in, in the region. So I think it's just worth keeping an eye on how these processes play out. It's going to affect thousands of property owners. And I think it's just worth keeping an eye on, on how Metrolinx interacts with the communities that it affects. And, you know, Metrolinx in the past, if you talk to people who live near Metrolinx transit projects, they say that Metrolinx is not often very transparent with them. I think it's fair to say Metrolinx has a bit of a trust issue with communities that it's building projects near. And so off the bat, I think that might kind of sour these processes as they unfold. But yeah, I, I should stress that legal experts and lawyers who I spoke to did say that Metrolinx handles things in a responsible way and that there is a legal regime in place that will protect people. The caveat to that, though, too, is that the Bill and Transit Faster Act is new. There is an Expropriations Act that governed all this stuff before last year. And so the Bill and Transit Faster Act has not totally been tested. So I think it'll be worth watching that as well. That's interesting to hear, as I don't live far from where the Ontario line is proposed to go. And I know that there are a lot of people up in arms about that. We have to take into account that there are some people who are nimby about any kind of transit planning in their neighborhood, but there have been some design changes to the East End plans and to the Young Line. Can you tell us a little bit about those? There's a section of the Ontario line. The Ontario line is a basically a 16 kilometer transit project. It's going to cross the, the city basically from the, the southwest to the northeast from Exhibition Place to the Ontario Science Centre. It's going to pass right through downtown. It's the most important transit project that the Ontario government is pursuing. That Doug Ford has described it as the crown jewel of the transit plan. But there's a controversial section of it that much of it runs below ground through the middle of the city, but Metrolinx is building it above ground through an existing rail corridor through the neighbourhood of Leslieville and Riverside, east of the Don Valley. 
And that's caused a lot of pushback from people in the community who say that the trains running above ground close to parks in their backyards and whatnot is going to have negative effects on the community. And basically, Metrolinx had planned to, has been for the last year telling people that the Ontario line tracks would basically straddle an existing go corridor run on either side. But just recently they announced, they didn't announce, actually just came out at a small public meeting that they're thinking of moving the tracks for the Ontario line to one side of the corridor, which would basically mean shifting some of the go tracks to the other side. And the details of this may may not strike people as particularly important, but it just spoke to, I think, the trust that the community has in Metrolinx because Metrolinx has been telling them for a year, it's going to be this way. This is the best way to do it. This will minimize impacts on the community. And now they're saying, actually, wait a second, we have to change the design. We have to shift the track to a new alignment and that's going to be the best way. And it just caught local residents off guard there. Again, this speaks to this issue of a, a trust deficit, I think, with the community and Metrolinx. And there's also plans for more above ground on the Young Line now too, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So uh, again, Metrolinx announced, I think it was two weeks ago now, that uh, the Young Line will be brought above ground for part of its section as it heads towards Richmond Hill. But I think what's really interesting to note about this is that both of these design changes are facing opposition from residents who live near them. So in Toronto, in the Ontario line, people are upset about the line being built above ground through their community. Up in Richmond Hill and Thornhill area, this design change that was recently announced means that the tunnel for the Yun subway will go beneath people's homes before it can come up above ground. And so people are upset on the Yun North line that the train's going to be going beneath them. People on the Ontario line are upset that it's going to be above ground. So I think that just speaks to some extent the difficulty and the challenges that Metrolinx is facing. Any kind of impact that these projects has on, on people's community is going to, I think, experience some pushback. And so I think uh, you can see the difficulty, I guess, of getting things built and getting buy-in from the community. I think I'm probably between about 30 and 50 meters away from that Ontario line. Go yeah, train go. Thing. So I'm going to have to probably go out and measure shortly after this conversation, yeah. or I'll just wait and see if I get one of these letters. Ben, this has been fantastic for us. The transit file is always moving in this city, no pun intended. What else are you watching right now? Well, I think I'm, I'm watching to see how far these projects get advanced before the election next year. I, I think that it's clear that the Ontario PC government would love to say that they you know, got shovels in the ground on some of these projects before people go to the polls next year. And I think that it'll be interesting to see after that too, which of these projects survive in what state they survive because you know it's a 28.5 billion dollar transit package here it's not fully funded the federal government has yet to commit some needed money to them so i i think you could see some of them dropping off the list or being deferred but i'd be interested to see whether any of that happens before the election in ontario in june of next year i think the other thing that you mentioned is is that the transit act has to be tested still and one of the things we talked about one of the reasons that you're doing a lot of these stories is that you're kind of doing a power check on Metrolinx because it does seem that they sort of, I don't want to say act haphazardly, but what do you think about the way that they're treating people? So I just think it's worth noting that this is an agency that has a significant amount of power. Metrolinx grew out of Go Transit, basically, but at first when it was created, it's, it's fairly new. It was only created in 2006. And it started off just running the GO trains, essentially, but now it's grown into this agency that you know is responsible for building billions of dollars worth of new transit projects in the Toronto region. And now apparently you need a permit if you're going to build a deck in your backyard near one of their projects. So it, its power has, has really kind of expanded over the years. And it's an agency that I don't think a lot of people in the GTA are necessarily too familiar with. It's not like the TTC that's been around for 100 years that has public meetings that you can go to regularly. Metrolinx is a bit less of an accessible organization that has, I think, less of a relationship with people. So I think it's just worth kind of keeping an eye on how they wield their expanded powers and just keeping people informed about what this you know pretty powerful agency is doing. Well, we thank you for it. <laughs> ben, this Thanks, is Reggie. fantastic for us. Thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, my pleasure. Ben Spur is the Toronto Star's transportation reporter. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Rajin Budder, Adrian Chung, and Saba Etizaz. 
produced and mixed by Sean Patton, and our director of programming is J.P. Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Thank you.